That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you picked that one. Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine. Is my That's the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. Welcome back to the Star Wars Expanded Universe, now by Disney, Arkham Lucasfilm, whichever way you slice it, Legends. We're here. Um... Without further ado... Star Wars Dark Nest 1 The Joiner King by Troy Denning. This is a trilogy that takes place after New Jedi Order and is meant to be a transition piece before the next big story arc. There you go. Don't really like the cover. Here's here's one for you. The art is yeah. Um Oh, uh, this last time we'll get the um, amazing um, Japanese art that I have on the on the thumbnail. Um, so here's my biggest complaint. Just get that out of the way, and it's one of my big ones: pacing. This book is too long. It didn't need to be. It's like 443 pages. It didn't need to be the. It didn't need to be that long. It. Uh, it takes a bit and it's noticeable um but here's the thing this isn't a 19 book series this is three books so it doesn't bother me as much it's all new stuff in here advancing the plot so I can deal with it a little bit more <clears throat> I will get into the stuff you you know I'm gonna talk about but I'll wait for spoilers for that <clears throat> non spoiler wise, um, this takes place, uh, well, it says five years, but according to Leland, she had six years. So, six years after New Jedi Order. Um, Jason's been gone for all this time. He went on, you know, he says at the end of Unifying Force, he's going to go and study some of the ancient and different Force sects. So, that's what he goes and does. And meanwhile, the galaxy has been rebuilding, has been coping with the Vong War and dealing with different um, minor conflicts since then and you know the world moves on so you know Jaina has been doing a whole bunch of stuff which would have been cool to see you know even if you're not a uh, big fan of this series there's a those six years could have told some interesting stories you know that don't uh, you know hurt your feelings but alas we don't have that because there's just a huge gap at the six years. Um, the, the New Jedi Order has completely embraced Vajir's philosophy. And so the Jedi Order is acting a bit differently than they normally tend to do. Not too different, but more willing to do certain things that they wouldn't have been before. Um... Now, the beginning of this book shows that the some of the younger Jedi Knights, basically the ones that were on the Merker mission, have um, kind of gone AWOL because they have, they heard a call, a call from something mysterious, and so they end up joining the, this Killick nest. Uh, of bugs. Now the Killicks are an interesting species. Um, they're bugs, but they actually do matter quite a bit, especially when we get down the line of Fate of the Jedi. So having a little story with them here is really important because they end up being beings that helped create Center Point Station. Why did they do that? Well, we'll get to that in Fate of the Jedi, but they're species actually matters quite a big deal and you know, I think this 
book has definitely been enhanced for me because of uh, Supernatural Encounters, because they also play a major role in that series. So, I mean, not a major, major role, but they, but they are important in that. So, you know, by all that context and everything, it makes this whole series interesting. In fact, they even mentioned Celestials in this book. That was first started here, which I didn't realize. But, um... What else can I, what else can I mention? But, so, you know, Han and Leia, Luke and Mara, the... This is causing conflicts with the Chiss, because um, the Kilix are bordering their colony close to the Chiss. It's actually not super close to the Chiss borders, so it's kind of also a mystery of why did the Chiss care so much about this. But it, you know, might end up becoming another conflict, and nobody wants that. There's also issues with the Jedi and the Republic. Which is not a rehash of New Jedi Order because it's, you know, peacetime. What happens afterward? You know, it, it, it's interesting how much people are willing to dismiss such things so easily. But it's it's a thing, too, of, like, and this isn't, like, a Nazi thing. Like, I'm not, I'm not making comparisons to that. I'm just saying, like, you know, you have World War One, and that was a conflict with multiple people. But one people get blamed for all of it, you know? So they're bitter and upset because they it wasn't all their fault. And then World War II happens because somebody used that as a means to launch forward, you know? And that was a clear-cut conflict, right? I think 99.9% .9 of people was like, yeah, bad guys, good guys. Like, that's pretty cut and dry. Most wars, most things in history aren't that cut and dry. Most things are gray, but that's pretty, like, bad guy, good guy, right? The Vong were bad guy, good guy. Of course, they wanted to find a peaceful solution, because that's who the Jedi are. But at the end of the day, it was bad guy, good guy. Same thing with the Empire, you know? So, but what happens after, happily ever after, what happens after peace, you know? Like, there's a lot of interesting things there, like, you know... With, with the government and how that would all work out that is explored in this book. So I think that's quite cool. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Jaina, Zek, Lobaka, a lot of the Alemarar are all a part of this, this Killick nest, and they're kind of getting this hive mind sort of joiner um, view of things. And so this is concerning for the Jedi because some of our own Jedi are being controlled. They're not controlled, but it is something affecting them. Um, so that's kind of where the crisis lies, is in these Jedi helping the, the Killix and the Chiss getting upset, and how are we going to solve this conflict, is essentially the main point of this first book. There's some really cool stuff I want to get into with who's running the Killix, but I can't get into that without talking about spoilers. Overall, though, you know, without talking about any of the things to defend it or, you know, to just shut up stupid people, but you, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. If you don't like this series, you're fine. Okay, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Okay, I'm just, it's a bit. But, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I think this book is a great little... Like, like, here's the thing, too. It feels like like a Bantam era novel. Like, this conflict's not, like, super-duper important in the grand scheme of things. It's not like it's the Vong War or defeating Palpatine. It is a relatively minor conflict in the grand scheme of things. Like, yeah, it can really screw up, like, the Jedi's relations with the Galactic Alliance and stuff like that. But, like, that, it's not like... It, it's all pol political and stuff. The, the, the ramifications, if this doesn't work out, it's not as if... The world will end if they don't solve this. But it feels like Return to Form. To me, it feels like a Bantamera novel. Like, the main story is Bantamera, where it's just like a fun little adventure. And the only other stuff is the characterization for characters, which is a big launching off point for the next series, so there's character development here for that. But the actual you know, conflict itself is not that big. It feels like a Bantamera novel. And that's really cool, because you just went through this 
grueling 19 book series. It's all dark and da da da. I mean, there were some fun moments, but it's still dark. And about this one storyline. So now we get a fresh new storyline. And, you know, the Killix aren't like the most interesting species ever, but, but there's actually quite a bit here that's enjoyable to read about, to me anyway. But I want to get into the meat and potatoes, and I can't do that in non spoilers. So I'll just say, yeah, for me, um, it's definitely worth your time. Again, my biggest issue accident. My biggest issue being pacing. It's just too long. But again, it doesn't feel that bad. Not like some of the other books. Now again, New Jedi Order might have just been because it's back to back to back to back to back to back to back of story just not ending. But it's not the case here. You know. I mean there is two more books in the series, but this feels like a like you a definitive end. Like you just could read this and it'd be fine. Um because everything kinda concludes here. With minus a few things left over. So but overall I had fun with it. I enjoyed it more than I think I did the last time, and again, that might be a bit because of Supernatural Encounters has kind of clouded my judgment on this story, but that's what the EU is supposed to do, right? Make other stories better, so, and enhance things, so thank you, Joe Bongiorno, for that, and you know what? Thank you, Troy Denning, because I actually really enjoyed this one, so, I'll tell you what, I enjoyed it more than Refugee, so, there's that. Uh, um, enjoyed it more than Survivor's Quest, um, or Hand of Thrawn, ooh, blasphemy, um, but yeah, so, good times. Spoilers now, if you don't want them, you know what to do, get out, uh, and if you don't, then everything you learn is a fault of your own. Um... Before I even get into it, I really need to stop listening to other people. And definitely for my own opinion. We're just going to get right off the bat with the big thing. In this first book, just this first book, people told me, oh my god, Jason, oh, it's blasphemy. He's nothing, nothing like he was before. They just completely stripped his character. And I was like, okay, well... Before I was saying, like, you know, six years. That's enough time for change. You know, trying to make all these justifications to his character. And I'm still, and I would still do that anyway. And I'd still like to make a story set between that two just to further develop him. But let me tell you. People are like, oh, that's, that's not him. It's a clone. He's so different. He's so different. He's so different. What books are you reading? This first book, he's basically Unifying Force, Jason. He's a little bit different because of the six-year gap and the things he learned. But, like, 95% of the Jason in this book is just Unifying Force, Jason. Um, here's a departure. He's funny again. He makes a little sarcastic remarks here and there, which is nice to see. Since that was originally a part of his character. But here's the biggest difference with him in this first book. I think him being unsure of who he is or what his purpose is, is not there no more. He is more confident in what he believes in, hence leading to him being less introspective and, I don't know, I guess worried about the decisions he's making at the most. If I'm really trying to find something there. But for all intents and purposes, he's fine. The stuff that people don't like is in the next two books, mainly. And that's when he starts to change. But that is the literal point of the side plot of him in this trilogy. To transition you into the next story arc. Here's Unifying Force, Jason. He's turning into this. So that when you get to the next series, you're not like, oh, that's jarring. No, because you had this trilogy to fill in the gap. He's really not that different in this first book. I just took everybody else's word on faith, not remembering this plot. But it's not that, it's not that deep. Y'all were just stretching because Troy Denning pisses you off. 
and I'm sorry that someone makes you so mad that you can't enjoy things. But no, it's not that bad. I just read it. I was really looking for how different and alien Jason is to the alien to, to the Jason I read in Unifying Force. It's not there. In the first book at least. Anyway. <clears throat> we have more things to discuss there. But I'm just gonna say it it was not that jarring. And to any discrepancies, six years. Deal with it. I'm not the same person I was six years ago. Um one of the things we learn about is pretty cool, um, that over the past, you know, six years, Jane has been beating up, like, 37 warlords of what? I don't know, because there's, I think they, all the Imperials are good now, um, so maybe just random losers, I guess, in the galaxy, I don't know, but the point is she's been taking down 37 warlords and over 100 smuggling, like, rings, she stopped, which... I mean, that's some nice work, Jaina. You could probably tell a really fun little story there. But, like, um, you could have by Aaron Alston. Um, or, like, maybe Stackpole or something. You could have told a really cool little, like, one novel that felt like a Bantamera novel with Jaina that doesn't, like, make you have to read this, you know? And you give a little, another little story in between, you know? That could have been cool. The Vong are adjusting, you know? We get to see the Vong at the very beginning. This last time we'll probably... We, we, we see them for a long time. But the Vong are, you know, on Zomna Sakat And they're trying to adjust to this new way of life. But, you know, caste systems are starting to form. And they're starting to fight amongst each other. And it's a thing they got to learn against. Because they're, they're so used to the caste system. And to that way of life. That it, it's really hard for them to kind of adjust to the fact that they're all equal. And they're struggling with that. So that, that was a really interesting... It wasn't a huge part of the book, but it was a little interesting. Again, I wish somebody would have explored that as like a side story. Um, Jason and Akana. And again, nothing in this part is particularly against what Jason is by what he says or by how he acts. It's just stuff that Akana's alluding to. But, I mean, it's, again, continuity and so cool. Like, I'm sorry, but like... Black Fleet Crisis, right? I mean, that was, like, my least favorite part of Black Fleet Crisis was, you know, Luke and Akana. But still, to bring Akana back, to have Jason learning from her, that's really cool. That's really, really cool. Now, again, nothing of his demeanor is that different. Besides, he's a bit more funny. Um, he's not disrespectful. He's not rude. He's nothing. Like, he's just the Jason from Unifying Force talking to Akana. It's just that Akana goes, like, if you leave... You know, I fear you may go dark. You know, a little on the nose. And a little, you know, setting up things. Very overtly. But, like, as far as Jason's demeanor in that section of the book, he's not acting any different. You know? So. But it was really cool. We also learned that not only did Jason hang out with the Falunasi, he hung out with the Jinnasari. From I, Jedi. With the Witches of Dothamir. And the Ang T monks, which <clears throat> are from a Western Games uh, sources, and then they also appeared in Han Fron. They'll appear again in Fate of the Jedi. And we learn in Supernatural Encounters that they are one of the first races ever in the universe, in this setting. So that's really interesting that he learned from them. That's where he learns flow walking, which we'll get into when we get there. <clears throat> Oh, another thing, um, with, uh, Osis, because I think people were coming, oh, it's just like the prequels, and now they are, they are working inside the temple like they did in the prequels, they just wanted to be the prequels again, they didn't care about continuity, they didn't care about the Star Wars expanded universe, well, let me remind you, good sirs or ladies, that... At the end of Unifying Force, that Luke does not say he's going to move his entire Jedi Order to Osis. Some Jedi suggest the place, and he says, sure, we can check it out. He by no means said that that was definitively their place. But I'll tell you another thing, they did set up an academy there. So, they have an academy on Osis, but the Jedi work at the Jedi Temple that they reconstructed 
in Coruscant because they are working with the Galactic Alliance. Hence, it would be good to have a place, a center, that is easily accessible to the Galactic Alliance, considering they work with them. Now, they say they don't work for them, but that's a whole other thing right there. If they're paying your bills, you kind of do, but we'll get into that. Um, yeah, the t all the Jedi have been rather busy over this six years um, dealing with minor conflicts and, you know, disputes with things and, you know, all political things. I also just remind everybody, in terms of chrono chronology, that Han and Lando are in their mid-60s right now. And Luke, Mara, and Leia are in their 50s. <clears throat> also, Ben Skywalker is 8. So, before, you know, Ben was just a baby, he didn't really have much character development, but this is where Ben starts to actually be a character. And Ben, like Jason, is kind of retreating from the Force, for, for, for different reasons. Um, he's, ben isn't super philosophical like Jason is in New Jedi Order. Ben is a lot like Anakin, where he can kind of just, like, a bit more headstrong, a bit more willing to make decisions. But he also fears the Force, for some reason. And so he's been refusing to use it. Which has been an interesting thing. And we'll delve in that further later. But it is interesting. And, you know... After this series, Legacy of the Force and Bay the Jedi... You know... And again, blast me, but... I love Ben. And I, I love Ben more than even Anakin Solo. So, it, it, it's interesting to see the start of his development. Um... We also know that there's a Bothan Crusade going on. This was mentioned, I think, in the end of Unifying Force, and it's still a thing here, where Bothans are trying to find the Vong and kill them all. And the Jedi are trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. But yeah, another interesting story that was missed out on. Um, I wanted to mention it just because I feel like someone else would be like, oh my god, Troy Denning is so sexual. There's a funny little moment with these like aliens that are like bird-like. They're like flirting with Luke, and he's really uncomfortable because his wife is around, and he's. But Mara doesn't care. Mara's secure in who she is, and that Luke knows he lucked out with her, so he. She's like whatever. And then he, you know, Luke just goes like, "I'm married," and they go, "Oh my god, well," and then they just they, they buck off like that's that's about it. That's the extent of it. It was just a funny little moment, but I'm sure somebody will make a big deal out of it because they love to do that. <clears throat> But yeah, Star by Star is very important for this story because it, it deals with a lot of the, the Merker people with Alema and uh, Zek and Jaina. Um, some, um, some cool things here. I like that Jason has a high pain tolerance. That it can just, kind of just endure a lot more than the average person due to everything. Not, not just Traitor, but like everything he's been through, he can kind of just deal with it. And I think that's awesome. Like he goes to this wreckage area and this this thing's hot and he places his hand on it and his hand's like sizzling and he doesn't even like notice or acknowledge it like he just doesn't care which I thought was really cool um and then flow walking so it's not time travel and I'll explain why um so Jason can travel to the past or he can view the past, but he can't actually interact with it. Now, the Force is a spiritual thing, right? We all know this. So, Jason goes to the past and does like um, a Force sort of like small little message to his mother. And she hears it. But, Jason can't like flow walk and physically walk out and like touch his mom and be like, Hey mom, how you doing? So it's not time travel in the sense of he's not actually traveling to the past. He can just explore it, you know? And sure, yes, he interacted with his mom in some sense. But again, he was using the force. So it's not the same thing because I, I, the force is not linear. The force encompasses everything. So that's something I can accept. If he was talking to like Han, I'd have a little bit more of an issue because Han's not a force sensitive. But as she was a force sensitive, it's not that big of a deal. So, 
in case anybody tries to throw that on you that it's contradictory, it's really not. You know, the f four sensitives, it's a different thing. But, you know, again, Jason can't flow walk to like 10 years ago and start fist fighting with, with Lando. Like, he can't interact physically with the world of the past, but he can't interact with force users. So that's not a contradiction to me, and that's fine. And flow walking, it's really cool. I like the ability. Again, it's something that not even Luke at this point knows how to do. It just shows how much Jason has learned in these six years. Um, this is the big one. So this is why Star by Star is kind of super important. Now, another thing. People say if you kill off characters, then don't bring them back. Um, depends on how you use them. If you use them well, then it's okay. If it feels like a waste, then yeah, don't. But, star by star, never explicitly said that this person died. They were presumed dead, so it's not the same thing. Um, but Raynar Thol is alive. He is now in charge of the Killick Nest. He is Unithol, the collective hive mind um, of the Killicks. Um, and his story is tragic. This guy dealt with the entire murder mission and dealt with all the Vong War, only to have this happen to him. And, you know, I, I, without too much spoilers, he does pop up later in Fate of the Jedi. And, you know, his story arc is phenomenal. I love Raynar. You know, if you're going to bring a character back, even though they are never explicitly dead, this is how you do it. You give them really cool story arcs. And it was great. I love Raynar. Raynar's an incredible character. And this first story is like really interesting with him dealing with the Killick Hive mind and, you know, being not controlled by them, but super heavily influenced by them. So, I love Raynar here, and I'm glad that they brought him back. Um... <clears throat> Uh, this is also where we learn, so I was looking, that the Killix built center point. I don't think we knew that before, but we know that now. Killix built center point station. Um, and that will be super important to Fate of the Jedi. But they were the ones that built built it for... Mysterious Celestials, which they don't further elaborate on. Um, and like I said, um, I, I wrote down, no menace from Jason, but the promise of power. There's a lot of subtle things here. Like, there's a moment where Mara's, like, sensing Jason and, like, kind of, like, analyzing him. Not for any malicious purposes, she's just doing it. And... Jason kind of looks at her, nods, no malice, no evil or anything, just genuine, like, hi, how you doing? You know, hi, Aunt Mara. You know, n nothing malicious, like, completely kind, but what just upset Mara is just the fact that, like, all my life I've dedicated to being, like, subtle in the force and, you know, being this assassin and stuff, you know, back when I was working for the Emperor. You know, so I've gotten very good at, like, hiding the fact that I'm probing. Um, and Jason just, just knew, just knew I was looking at him. So, you know, it just shows how powerful Jason is, but it's not, and then I mean, just like him acting out of character. He was being completely kind and everything to her. Um, so I, I just want to mention this because Leia makes what seems pretty clear to me to be a joke to Han about Zek being a vent crawler and it wasn't like in the context of the little quote it didn't feel like Leia was being serious it felt like she was doing what they always do which is banter but people go oh she just hates Zek why what did Zek ever do to her and it just feels like at that point, some people are being extremely uncharitable and just want to find a reason to dislike this. So, whatever. Oh, and then 
there's hot cocoa, just thought I mentioned again. You know, that start with the Therontrology and it's here again with the friggin' hot cocoa mix, so that's funny. Um, and then prequels. Uh, it's, it's less contrived. It's still contrived, but it's less contrived than Tatooine's Ghost. Um, so another side plot within the story is that R2's kind of acting up, and they don't know exactly why, but there's these memories that he's been trying to suppress or keep away, um, cataloged in the back of his mind, and, you know, Luke starts to see some of it, and he gets to see Padme, you know, and, and the explanation is that for all these years, you know, R2-D2 just wanted to save him from the pain of knowing about it. So this trilogy, um, a side plot of the whole thing is just Luke trying to learn about his past. And again, I'm sorry, I like that. All the prequels are done now. Let's Luke, the whole thing with Black Flea Crisis was Luke wanted to know what his mom looked like, or wanted to see his mom. So now that we know, why not let him have that closure? That's that's great for him. Let him let him see his mom. Let him see Padme. Oh, but we hate the prequels. Like I get it. It is contrived. But at the same time, I don't mind it. I like the prequels. I like when they try to connect things like that. I appreciate it. I get why other people, I guess, wouldn't if they hate the prequels or whatever. But for me, that was a definite positive. So, uh, and there'll be more of it. How can you not realize how base this story is? Jason and Tina Ka. Ugh. Oh, God. How it should have been. Instead of stupid, 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 stupid Danny Kui. So, Jason and Tina Ka are romantically involved again, as they should have always have been from the get-go. Um, and Jason goes to see Tina Ka on Hapes, which there's there's some time jumps here, so. Um, one thing I noticed, though, is that Jason just really, like, not super, like, like, not like a median or nothing, but he's a lot more quippy than he was in all of New Jedi Order, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it, because that's more in line with Young Jedi Knight's Jason, is this character right here that we're seeing in front of us. You know, like, the burden of, of the war may still be on him, but he... Traveled for six years, and I guess he just regained some of what he lost. You know, some of that freaking humor that I've missed so much from this kid. And, you know, he... There's some good conversations between him and Tinoka. But, you know, it ends with her asking him to stay the night. And that will be important for several things down the line. So... Gorog Killick. So this is where the Darkness gets introduced. There's a whole separate faction of, of the Killicks with the Darkness faction. Because we also learn that Lomi Plow and um, freaking what's the other one? Welk are still alive. And they're kind of controlling. Because if you're Force sensitive, you can kind of influence the Killicks. Because the, the Killicks that Raynar or Unithal are under um, are like helping people when they're hurt and injured and just being caring to the individual. Um, but these other groups are not, and that's because they're being led by dark users. But, one of the Killicks is called Gorog. Now, I don't think there's any deeper meaning behind it, but it does make that whole thing significantly cooler because you have the Gorog in Supernatural Encounters, which just makes that name significantly matter more. So, I, I love that. Again, SC enhancing something to make it better. So, oh, and I've never been one for, for action scenes in my novels because I just can't get into them. But I'll tell you what, that Welk versus Saba scene was incredible. This is one of the few times I've been really enthralled in a fight in Star Wars. That was really good. That was really good. Wait, it was very violent, but at the same time, like the way it was described and everything, like I could see it all in my head. And I don't usually do that. With, with with action scenes. That was really cool. Also, might I mention 
that Saba Sub Teen continues to be one of my favorite new additions. Now I know people, some people hate her because we hate fun and we hate cool things, but Saba, Saba in all of New Jedi Order since she was introduced um, to everything here, she's just one of my favorite Jedi ever. She's just so much fun to read about. I love, I love, I love, I love Saba, and that fight was awesome. And Lemma, um, I just want to mention, like, this book is probably the most we get with Lemma, because she was kind of just always around in New Jedi Order. They didn't really use her that much for anything after Star by Star, which was kind of sad. They kept her around, but she didn't do very much. Um, so I, I appreciate the development here. One thing I didn't like, and I don't remember the context, but they explicitly mention, the, they, they say the word sex, and for some reason that's more upsetting to me than... Prince Zord hitting on Leia just because I mean sex is a thing in Star Wars I just I'm not used to hearing it in Star Wars so th there's one diss I guess that I don't have for the book oh and then Alema versus Leia round one so Alema is working with the hive mind you know so she's not exactly to blame at this point she's not completely all gone it's more the influence she's under but uh, she fights Leia and, and Leia kind of gets her butt handed to her um, and this kind of gets into uh, her kind of arc moving forward but we'll get to that and Form B from um, Survivor's Quest, he's in this, so that, was, that was a cool little connection there um, Moral Relativism so with the rise of the Jedi accepting Vergeer's philosophy, you know, it brings a lot more complications to missions and stuff and views of the Force because they don't believe in the light or dark side, you know, it's just the individual, right? There, There is no light or dark. Here, here's what I'll say to you, to everyone, you know, both sides of the aisle. I don't particularly like how Troy Denning kind of describes it as like they're using both light and dark side now. Because that's not that's not the point of New Jedi Order. It's not that they're going to use both like a gray Jedi and that stupid um, fan theories about that. It, it, it's there is no light or dark side, so we're not using anything. We're not using light or dark side. We're just using the Force, which is still kind of the point. I just don't like the way that um, Troy Denning phrases that, as if they still believe in a light or dark side, because they don't. Because that's not what Jason believes in. That's not what Vergeer believed in. She didn't believe in the light or dark side. There is no such thing. There's just you, the individual. And if you're a good guy or a bad guy, which is still ultimately the point, but I just don't like the way it's just described there. But Because it's described as them using light and dark. But I thought we just established for several books that there is no light or dark. You know? So it, it, it's that that's a slightly annoying thing. But still, the overall point is that they just don't, they don't believe in these things anymore that there's something to fear from it, it, it's just the force and you serve the force or you don't serve the force and that's that's what's dark if you don't serve the force if you serve yourself then that's that's the, that's the bad thing but you know you, you can't actually do any wrong by using certain techniques or anything because it's just a technique you know so that's not out of line but it also comes with a lot of moral relativism in terms of well what should we do you know there's no light or dark side so so it's the same thing of like, well, there's no God, so we can do whatever we want. Like, I don't want to hurt people. That's just me, though. But I can't control other people. Um, I, I would get more into it with moral relativism in general, but I, it's Star Wars, I'm not doing that. But um, it, it was an interesting thing to be brought up here. Omos, career politician. I'm sure people dislike this too, but this makes a lot of sense. So, Omos during the war was very helpful. Because he knew who his allies were, he knew what he needed. He needed the Jedi if they were going to complete this conflict, if they were going to end this conflict. But sometimes leaders are very good in a crisis, and are not very good for during peacetime. Leia was. She knew how to work that game. Omos doesn't. He capitulates, he gives in too easily, and he makes promises that he can't keep. 
That is the issue with Kamala Moss. He is, for all intents and purposes, the stereotypical career politician. He is not a bad person. He is not a villain. He is not even a Borsk Fela. He is simply inadequate to do the job when it comes to peacetime. And it causes a lot of conflicts among the Jedi. And again, this is a, a big thing too, because Cal almost made a lot of promises in New Jedi Order. But if you really think about it, how is he going to sustain any of those promises to the Jedi? Because he's making demands of them, asking him to do these things like, hey, you told us that we wouldn't be beholden to the Galactic Alliance. You said we would be separate. He said, yeah, well, we pay your taxes and you live on our soil and we fund you. So you will help me. I don't care right now. Okay? Your special privilege revoked right now. I'm paying your electricity bill. You're going to do what I say. And that's a fair point. If the Jedi truly don't want to be, you know, if they want to, don't want to be beholden to the Galactic Alliance, then they sh shouldn't have any relation to the Galactic Alliance. They should be a completely separate entity. But instead, they'd rather work with it, which, I mean, fair enough, that it gives you a lot more advantage, a lot more possibility, a lot more um, goals and opportunities to get certain things done. But that comes at the price. And, you know, Korn kind of understands that. Luke and I mean Luke's more neutral in matter but Kip's like yeah I mean no, we're Jedi we, we're not beholden anyone but ourselves we serve the force not politicians which is not an exact backtrack on New Jedi Order it's just like you know similar issues are arising but it, it, it's more so the thing now is okay well peacetime has happened and what do we do now and I really enjoy the discussions there of, you know, what are the Jedi allowed to do and not to do, and, you know, um, this new political landscape that has to be concerned about after the events of New Jedi Order. <clears throat> Frick, my notes. Here's another thing that people like to do. So there's a scene where Le uh, Jaina and Zek are cuddling with clothes on because the Killix had like some sort of weird like dance hive mind thing it people make jokes and say it's an orgy it wasn't an orgy they're still wearing clothes and even Jaina says nothing happened um did the scene need to be in there no it's one of the parts I'm like this is wasting time why is this here you know there's a little weird denning moment but again it's not as if anything actually happened People just want to make a big deal out of nothing, and it's really annoying. But yeah, I'll agree with you. It's not like the best scene or anything. It's just kind of there, and I'm like, okay, but why? So, um, but they figured out about the darkness. They figured out with Welk and Lummy Plow and Lumarar. So they get this, you know, um, I guess I should also mention, you know, the Chiss and that whole th situation and Jag getting involved in the situation. Um, because it's really hard for, like, Han and Leia, you know, Jason's been gone for six years, he just came back, Anakin's dead, and now you have Jaina being controlled by these joiners, like, what? But by the end of it, I think it's pretty clear that it's kind of over, um, but by the end of it, they, they kind of figure out a solution. Um, it, it's kind of sad, too, because the Athorians, you know, their planet got destroyed by the Vong, you know, back during New Jedi Order, and so... Leia was finally finding them a new place to relocate. But because of politics and everything, even though she didn't want to be a politician anymore, she's like, oh, look, Omos, we can put the Killix here, and that will get them away from the Chiss, and we can have peace. But you need to promise me that you're going to find a place for the Athorians soon. So, you know, but it it gets the job done. And so they, they solve the conflict. Lomi Plow and Welk are you know, get away, or I don't know if Welk does, but Lomi Plow still around. And the conflict is seemingly resolved. You know, there's still some loose threads there, but overall things are fine. Jason helped, he, he got the Hapen fleet to move um, the Killix over to this new planet. I thought it was cool. And everything's kind of just like a happy ending. Like, it, it's a good little standalone novel if you didn't read the other two. Like, you kind of just stop here. It's like, here's a fun little bantam era thing but of course there's more to be told here um also i apologize if i a little bit off it's like i have a morning shift and it's like 
3 a.m. in the morning. So, but I wanted to talk about it. Um, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would because I remember being kind of bored by it. I was, you know, so, you know, people keep saying things about the trilogy, so I was, you know, worried they might be right. But, like, I, I really tried to find what they were talking about, and at least in this first book, I don't see it. But overall, it was a fun little adventure. You know, nothing too crazy. Amazing EU connections. Some proper things like Jason being with Tino Kahl like he always should have been. Um, even Jaina's whole thing with and Zack with the the Kill a Hive Mind anything was, was interesting at least. And I'm excited for what the series has to offer moving forward. There's only two books left and then we move on to the next big story arc. But I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I, I think Supernatural Encounters helped a lot with that. And I appreciate this book a lot more than I did the first time around. But overall, it was a fun time, and I'm excited to get into book two of the Dark Nest Trilogy by Troy Denning. So, until next time, guys, may the Force be with you. And yes, there'll be more Jason stuff as you move into book two and three. The avid defender that I am. I love the story arc, though, overall. And, um, you know, no memes aside, if you dislike the story, that's okay. We can still be friends. But, I do love this story. Not this one in particular, this is fine. But the overall arc of this whole thing that's going on, I do approve. And, you know, when you love something or when you have fun with something, you like to talk about it. It's why I have a channel. So, there'll be more talking to down the line. Until next time, guys. May the force be with you. Bye-bye.